Thanks for being here tonight. We are in a series that we're calling Listening Carefully to Jesus, and each week we're just taking time to look specifically at a few things that Jesus said and try to sort of think through those together on a given topic and explore that. Uh, it's going to go for quite a few weeks, and um, I know Peter spoke last week, but I'll be speaking most of the, the rest of the weeks in the next few, so you kind of know what to expect, either probably something you look forward to or something you don't look forward to. I don't know what's going to happen, but um, it will be somewhat consistent. Uh, we are going to do something special with this series now that we're sort of past the beginning of the year and all of the, um, just the advertising, all the different events and stuff. We're going to be putting out uh, over the weekend yard signs, and I'm really excited about these. Um, we have these yard signs, Steon did a great job on these, that have, you know, they have different images of Jesus and then different sayings from Jesus, and so there's actually like 66 individual different ones of these that are going, or 33 double-sided. Um, and then our goal is to sort of blitz the campus with the words of Christ, because I think for most people, um, you know, you can go months or a year and maybe you hear one thing Jesus said, maybe you know it's from Jesus, maybe you don't. Uh, more and more with the just biblical illiteracy of our of our culture that people don't even realize that some of these famous sayings and things are the words of Christ. That doesn't mean they don't have power if you don't know, but I think people are just pretty unfamiliar with Jesus and what he actually said. And so all 66 of these are from Matthew, and we may do more later. Um, but we see this as a way to, uh, you know, start conversations on campus. We know from past experience that people really look at the yard signs, are affected by the yard signs. Um, and, uh, and so we want to communicate that out to our campus. And so uh, we, we do need help. We have what we call a blitz team that puts out our yard signs. Paul's, Paul's a very big believer in the blitz team. Um, <laughs> So I think we're going to pass some clipboards because for this, what's going to happen is we don't want people to like see these two sayings because these are the two that are on their way to class and then never again. So every two or three days, we're actually going to go swap them out a little bit so that they'll be, since they're all unique, they'll be moving around. So we're going to need a lot of help with that. Um, that doesn't mean you have to do it a bunch of times, but if it, it's a pretty easy thing to, you know, get with a friend, uh, walk through campus, pick one up, take it two stakes down and put it down, pick that one up, take it two stakes down, that kind of thing. So we're going to be moving those around. They'll have a plan for that. That clipboard's going to be coming around. Um, and this is also an opportunity if you have, uh, you know, people that you think this series of teaching would be particularly helpful to, think about people that you might want to invite or uh, share these messages with. <clears throat> so tonight, listening carefully to Jesus about salvation and I'm excited about this one because I think we often, um, especially if you're a part of the, the sort of Protestant movement, we, we listen really carefully to the Apostle Paul about salvation, um, but often we don't listen carefully to Jesus about this. And we come to this topic of salvation from a lot of different directions. I think some of us love to argue over salvation, our soteriology um, you would think that would usually be like our Protestant and Catholic brothers and sisters arguing with each other, but it's not. It's mostly just Protestants arguing with each other. Um, I think sometimes we don't really believe in salvation by faith alone. We believe in salvation by being right alone and that uh, by being right about everything. Um, and so we just, you know, we got to make sure we're right. Um, but, but Jesus cuts through a lot of that and praise God that he has enough grace to cover all the new ways we come up with of being sinful idiots. Um, but some of us sit around and stress about salvation quite a bit. And I know in our community, I have conversations that there, there are people here who have, you know, they struggle with this idea of salvation or this question of salvation because of specific passages. I, I probably don't go um, a year without having someone come talk to me about Jesus's words about blaspheming the Holy Spirit or different things like that. 
we can have a lot of anxiety around being saved. I, I laugh, even, even the traditions uh, where we believe, you know, uh, salvation by faith alone and once saved, always saved, sometimes that produces the most anxiety. It's like, yes, but did I get it right the first time? You know, so I, I think back to one of the guys I was studying the Bible with a, a while back, and I was asking him, like, have you had any sort of salvation experience? And he's like, yes, I've prayed Jesus into my heart five times and then baptized twice, but I don't know, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I'm like, probably are, but let's, let's keep, you know, let's talk and explore. And so it just shows that we can have a lot of anxiety around this. Some of us don't think much about salvation at all. I think we like to entertain, you know, what I would call a fantasy that everything's going to turn out great for everyone, except, of course, for Hitler, anyone else who's actually bad, which is just a vague concept that we don't want to think much about because we know deep down that our house of cards is pretty fragile and we don't want to think about it. But I think Jesus has something to say to all of us, not just those groups, but all of us, if we're willing to listen carefully. And so let's dive in. We're going to look at three different passages, sort of in depth, the ones that Elizabeth and, and Dina read for us. So let's start with John 3. And I'm going to just, I'm not going to try and put these words up here. You, if you have a phone, you can find this. You can Google these things. John 3, I'm going to start in verse 14. I'm going to read from the NIV because I didn't think that I could get away with talking about Jesus and salvation without reading John 3.16. Um, though, interestingly, when we get to John 3.16, there is debate over is this something that Jesus said, or something that the author, John, was saying, commenting on that. So depending on different versions, you may see or not see 16 in the red letters. Um, when you go back in the Greek, there's no, there's no quotation marks. So there's a little bit of guesswork at times. So um, we're going to assume Jesus said it, or at least that we're just commenting on what he said in 14 and 15. So John 3, 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness... So the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So this is a reference to the Old Testament. And there's a scene in, in uh, the book of Numbers where the, the people have been wicked yet again. And they've sort of betrayed God yet again. And a, a plague comes on them. They start, um, they start dying because snakes are biting them and all these different kinds of things happening. And, and they're sick and they, they're, they're poisoned in all of this. And ultimately, what God tells Moses when the people start repenting is he says, I want you to make this, this uh, statue sort of of a snake uh, wrapped around something and I want you to hold it up and whoever will come and look at it they're going to be saved. And so that was just sort of the maybe seem arbitrary seeming thing that God said of like, here, I'm giving you a way out. If you trust me enough to do this thing uh, that obviously has no real meaning, then uh, I will save you. And if not, so Jesus references this back, just like Moses did that. So the son of man, and that's his sort of favorite way of referring to himself in the gospels, must be lifted up. And so there's a, a reference here to his crucifixion so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So in other words, if we look to Jesus, we're going to experience this salvation or healing. And then he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they haven't believed in the name of God's one and only son. And so the core message that, that I want us to hear tonight as we look through all of these is that when we listen carefully to Jesus, we find a radical claim about salvation. And that is that Jesus is the focal point of salvation. Jesus is the focal point of salvation. In verse 16, that little word so, for God so loved the world, that's so famous, that is a Greek word that's translated there. It's this word hutos, and it really has two potential meanings. 
And John is sort of, in his gospel, is kind of famous for all these sort of double entendres, where he kind of says one thing, you know, says a word that can mean two different things, and he sort of intends both meanings. He wants you to, to know. And so uh, that, that word in this case, hutos, can mean, you know, how much something is happening or in this way. So in other words, it, it means something like, for God loved the world so much that he showed his love in this way. He gave his only begotten son. That the so is expressing both the, the magnitude of God's love and the way that he went about expressing it. And in both cases, Jesus is the focal point. Jesus coming into the world shows us God's love and his salvation. See, Jesus is the focal point of salvation, not faith. And a lot of times, well, these have been the arguments for, for hundreds of years, and I'm not against salvation by faith. But salvation by faith is about getting our focus on the focal point. It's about where we look to get salvation, just as Moses raised up that snake so that anyone that looked at it would be saved. God is raising up Jesus so that anyone who looks to him will be saved. He is the focal point. For God loved the world so much. See, sometimes we're tempted to think I've sinned too much. God wouldn't want me anymore. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I know. I've talked to some of you. <laughs> I've talked to some of you. But see, Jesus' words here remind us that with all the vast wickedness in the world, think about up to this time, the world that Jesus was in, slavery, rape, murder, genocide, war, all sorts of sexual perversion and abuse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For God loved that world so much that he showed his love in this way. He gave his only begotten son. You haven't sinned too much. Jesus' presence here is a, a message to us that we haven't sinned too much. We need to look to him. Later on in John 6, Jesus says, all those that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And I think there's a message there for those of us that are experiencing that sort of anxiety around, have I done something too bad? My only question is, are you still soft-hearted enough to go back to Jesus? Because anyone who goes to him, he won't ever drive away. Jesus is the focal point of salvation, and he's telling us that it will be our response to him that determines everything. Not how much doctrine we know, not how good we are, but ultimately our response to him. So let's go deeper in that. Let's go over to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, and we're going to start in verse 13. So this is a part of Jesus' most famous sermon, arguably at least, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7. There's this whole set of teaching here. And this is the ending of it. After he's talked about a whole lot of other things, he comes to this place and he starts talking about the question we have tonight. So in verse 13, he says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. See, this is a, this is a hard one because, again, we've got... We've got a message going around in our culture. We live in a pluralistic culture, and I think that's a, a wonderful thing. 
Uh, we live in a culture that has all sorts of freedom of expression, and again, I think that's a wonderful thing. But I think the danger is that we start thinking that that just means everything's equal. Everything's the same. And we use that in really weird ways. You know, it's like, well, everything's really basically the same morally. I'm like, no, it's not. You know, some of you have lived in horrific homes growing up and had horrific experiences, and it makes light of those. Oh, it's all basically the same. It's not. Some of you have lived in really blessed circumstances, and it makes light of other people's pain to say it's all basically the same because it's not. You were blessed. You have something to be really thankful for. And different behaviors produce different results. We know this. What about this universe, what about this life communicates to you that no matter what you do, we all get the same outcomes? That's just not the way the universe works. And Jesus is going to go on to articulate this using an image from plants. So let's see what he says. Watch out for false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. See, we know that whatever kinds of seeds we plant, that's what kind of plant we'll harvest later. But then we try to convince ourselves that that only applies to plants. <laughs> But Jesus is saying, no, this is the way the world works. What we invest is what we get back. The kind of plant you have is the kind of fruit you'll eat. My dad used to say, you know, there's that expression about sowing your wild oats when you're young. And he would always say, if you want to sow your wild oats, you better like the taste of them. Because it's, that is what you will get. If that's what you plant, that's what you're going to harvest. But here Jesus does something interesting because he, he, he starts by saying there's two different paths, right? There's a narrow path that leads to life, and there's a broad path that leads to destruction. And then he immediately seems to shift gears to this watch out for false prophets. What's going on here? I don't think he's shifting gears. I think he knows no, none of us walk these paths by ourselves. We're all following someone. We're all walking along with someone. We've hitched our wagon to some group. And so Jesus knows that if you want to walk this narrow path to life, you're going to have to be careful about who you hitch your wagon to. And some of you, even just in the last few weeks, have hitched your wagon to the wrong people already. Some of you have hitched your wagon to the right people. And for many of you, you don't even know whether that is yet. Because what does he say here? He doesn't say the false prophets are going to be obvious. He says they're going to come in sheep's clothing. Inside, there's something different. You can't tell from their appearance what they really are. You only can tell from what their life produces. I remember a guy who I actually got to lead core with a long time ago here on this campus, and um, really winsome guy, a lot of fun to be around, um, was a great you know, core leader from my perspective, and, uh, but, but there was sort of drama swirling around him at different times, and I would kind of step in and try to you know, fix this different you know, situations and help and support. But then I started having different people come and, and talk to me, and I didn't really trust them. You know, I was like, I know him. But they would say things like, he's not nice to us like he's nice to you. And I, I ultimately got to see what I hadn't seen before. 
It was by his fruit in all of our lives that we saw what he was. And I'm not calling him a false teacher or a false prophet. I don't, but, but I think the point of what Jesus is saying is who are you following? Who are you walking along this road with? One of my mentors growing up would say, choose your friends carefully. You'll probably spend eternity with them. Because we hitch our wagons together and we go the same direction. What do the people that you're around produce in the lives of the people that they're around? What do they make? Do they make you better or do they make you worse? And then Jesus says here, every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's interesting, Peter read us last week, if you were here, from John 15, and there Jesus used a very similar image. He says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. If you don't remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. And Peter was talking about how that remain in me expression could be translated, those who make their home with me. Where do we find home? And so Jesus is not saying here that the punishment for no fruit is being burned. He's saying that when you don't want to remain in the vine, you don't produce fruit and he respects your decision. See, that's the scary thing about all of this, is that Jesus seems to respect each one of us enough to let us make the call and to accept the consequences of that call. He gives us that right, and he doesn't force himself on any of us. If you don't want to remain in the vine, he will respect your decision, but he does warn you where that decision goes. And I think this does bring up questions that we all have and we don't have time to get into tonight of what does it look like when we're not saved? You know, what is hell and these different ideas? And I would just say there's a lot we could talk about, but I don't think it's really explained very clearly at all in the Scripture I know some people think it is, but often I think we're pulling a lot of different words um, that aren't the same Greek word, and we translate them all the same way, and then we try to build something. I don't think it's explained, but I do think it's clear that it's going to be bad, that you don't want to go down that road. Jesus says in 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So my gut is this is the fruit of these false prophets that he's talking about. People who do all sorts of spiritual things and who even in some sense seem surprised, but they weren't really interested in God's will. They were doing their own thing in some way. But again, here we have at, at, this, at this moment of choice, the question seems to be in 23, did Jesus know you? Is there a relationship there? Whoever remains in me, whoever makes their home with me and I with them will bear much fruit. Jesus is the focal point of salvation. But then in verse 24, we get a key word, therefore. And as many have said, whenever you find a therefore in Scripture, you've got to ask yourself what it's there for. Because he's saying, based on what I've just said, here's here's the point. Here's the point. So away from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. These are bold words if he's not being honest. Because he says it's all going to boil down to what you do with my words. Now notice here, he doesn't say anything about people who don't hear his words. He's talking about, here's, there's two groups of people that I'm talking about. They both have heard my words. It's about what they do with them. But our challenge is, at least with some of them, you are now in the group of people who have heard some of his words. <laughs> Sorry. No, and, and so it's going to be your response to Jesus that determines your outcomes. He's the focal point of salvation. Do we look to him or not? And then let's go over back to John in John 17. We're going to start in verse 1. This is Jesus praying the night before his crucifixion. And he just says, John says, After Jesus said this, he looked up towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you've given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I think a lot of times when we think about this idea of salvation and we think about eternal life, Jesus is just sort of the means to an end. We've got a picture of heaven or what we want that to look like, what we want this reward to be. But Jesus sees himself as the focal point of salvation. This is ultimately about him. It's ultimately about relating to him. See, from the very first pages of the Bible, life comes from God. Early on in Genesis, it uses this imagery of God sort of forming people out of mud and then breathing life into them. And, and that word, the, the breathing thing is really interesting because in both the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New, um, that same word, it's uh, ruach in the, in the old and pneuma in the new, is, is life or is breath and wind and spirit. And without those things, we have no life in us. Biblically, I think a human is a, a matter that is imbued with life from God. We're not some sort of spirit trapped in a body. Without a body, we're not a human. That's just what we are. And so when we think about this is eternal life, knowing Jesus, knowing him. Number one, the word know is also a little bit, um, uh, you know, squishy. And we, this is the same in English, right? There's, there's relational knowing and then there's actual knowing, knowing about. You know, when I was dating my wife, now Sarah, I knew a lot of things about her. And I even, you know, I asked lots of questions. I even asked questions of her past roommates and of her family and just trying to kind of get to know a lot of things about her. But it was very different actually making my home with her. Sleeping beside her every night. Seeing day in, day out the way that she lives her life. And that's the process that we go from knowing about to knowing relationally. And I think what Jesus isn't saying here is this is eternal life that you know about God and that you know about his son, Jesus Christ. It's not knowing about, it's knowing, knowing them. Jesus is the focal point. 
And I think a part of what he's trying to communicate to us here is if you don't want to be with Jesus, there is no life for you. There is no salvation. It's kind of like if, if we were an astronaut out connected to the, the International Space Station and we've got that tether, you know, one that's holding us there so we don't just float off, but also that's got air coming to us so that we can breathe. I don't, I don't have anything sufficient to give me life. If I cut that tether and cut that tube that's giving me air, it's like, they're fine. I'm the one that's not fine anymore. I don't have any life in me. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to get at here, that if you don't know God, our life comes from him. And if you choose to be away from him, if you choose to cut that tether, there's nothing left for you. C.S. Lewis has a, a famous little book called The Great Divorce, and it's a little novella. Um, but in the introduction, he just is, is kind of talking about, he's, he's kind of exploring ideas of, of heaven and hell and why people choose to be apart from God. But he, he basically says, I think we're all going to look back at this lifetime as sort of the foyer of whatever we've chosen. It's like, yeah, like this life, the same world that we all live in is either the, the foyer of heaven or the foyer of hell. I started, I made the choice here. Which one am I entering? Where am I going? I can go deeper down that road, but it all starts now. We're living it even now. We're experiencing it even now. So in the end, Paul does come back much later in the scripture and talk a lot about salvation by faith, that it's by faith alone. But what did he mean by that? And I think so often we come, we get the, it's kind of like the knowing about versus the knowing. This word faith, pistis in the Greek, it can mean believe, you know, what do I believe? But, but in a it can also be a more relational word of trust. Who do I trust? See, it's not salvation by belief in a set of ideas. It's salvation by trust in a person. I think it might be more helpful for us to use a different word that's less confusing to us because what I think Paul is trying to get at that actually lines up with everything we've heard from Jesus today is that salvation is by allegiance alone. It's about complete trust in a new king, in a new leader, in a new prophet. Where do I put my faith? Who am I looking to? Praise team, you guys can come back up. If we listen carefully to Jesus about salvation, the thing that's clear over and over and over again is that Jesus sees himself as the focal point of salvation. The focal point is not in me. The thing about me is how I respond to him. What is my stance towards him? And that's why we're going to take time in the coming weeks to look and, and listen carefully to what he said. Not just to get our sort of doctrines right, but to actually hear for ourselves again and ponder his words. Because it's, if, if he's serious and if he's honest, it's going to be what we do with his teachings that determines whether our house will stand or fall when the storms come. So let's pray. God, I want to pray that you uh, would help us to be careful listeners. I pray that we could see Jesus more clearly. I pray that we would uh, respond in a way that uh, pleases him and that leads to deeper knowing him. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Yeah, great job. Yep. Yeah.